In this small site, and in the ravines behind, the Nazis murdered somewhere between 40 and 80,000 people, mostly Jews, between 1941 and 1944. Yet today, little remains of the camp that was here, and most of the site itself is off limits to visitors. How do we visit historical places that are inaccessible to the public, or worse, not even there? Can we reconstruct those sites in the virtual world from archival sources? What can we learn from these digital reconstructions? Hi, I'm Dr. Waitman Bourne, and I am trying to answer these questions in my new project, Visualizing Yanovska, creating a digital architectural model of a Nazi concentration camp. I'm a public-facing historian and a digital humanist. I'm interested in how we can use the digital world to help us understand the past. Ten years ago, I stumbled upon the Yanovska concentration camp, which was established in Lviv, Ukraine in 1941. This led to my latest book, Between the Wires, the Yanovska Camp and the Holocaust in Lviv, which will be published in the summer of 2024. This terribly small place served as a prison, a slave labor camp, and a dedicated killing site. The camp also functioned as the departure site for hundreds of thousands of victims on their way to the gas chambers of the Belzic and Sobibor extermination centers. Despite a number of memoirs by survivors and being part of the second largest Nazi trial in German history, Yanovska has been more or less overlooked by historians. This is surprising because the story of Yanovska is such an incredibly compelling one. It is a history full of tragedy and almost unimaginable horror, but it is also a story of heroic resistance and survival. Indeed, in 1943, the prisoners of the camp revolted, killing their guards and escaping. A desire to tell the story of this place is what led me to think about a digital model of the camp. Unfortunately, little of the Anoska site itself is left for us to study. After World War II, the Soviets continued to use the camp as a prison, and after independence in 1991, the new Ukrainian government kept operating the prison. The area around the camp, where thousands of people were shot, was used as a pig farm and a police dog training site, among other things. This means that, with a few exceptions, the site is both physically inaccessible and mostly destroyed. One of the things I've learned as a public-facing historian is that spaces themselves critically influence the way we understand and experience history. There's no good substitute for actually walking the ground. And when we are visiting sites, we want to understand our spatial position in them. Where are we? Where are we in relation to the features of the site? We are constantly trying to orient ourselves and trying to translate between what we see now and what the place was like in its own time. This is why we are so drawn to maps, reconstructions, and other interpretive aids. So how can we visit a site that no longer exists? This is a particular problem for the Holocaust, where many sites, and particularly the extermination centers, were literally erased by the Nazis themselves. Elsewhere, camps were dismantled for a variety of reasons, leaving us with an altered landscape that only hints at what the space was like during the Holocaust. Of course, this is not a problem unique to the Holocaust, and so hopefully this project will be of interest for other heritage spaces as they consider how to combine virtual spaces and physical ones. The Visualizing Yanovska project has two main goals. The first is to build a digital reconstruction of the Yanovska camp, and the second is to create an online learning platform built around the model. To build the model itself, I'm working with an architect as well as a digital modeler. We will be reconstructing the geometries of the individual buildings in architectural software and then rendering them in Unreal Engine. To be clear, we are not of course building an interactive game. 
Unreal Engine is a powerful 3D digital platform that allows for the creation of immersive environments. The visualization, however, will be firmly grounded in historical sources. So what are some of the sources that we are relying on? This project brings together a diverse set of historical and archival documents to tell us about the spaces of the Anofsky camp. There are, of course, textual descriptions left by both survivors and perpetrators that tell us about the geography of the camp and also what took place there. I've also found a set of Luftwaffe aerial photographs taken in 1944 that show the camp while it was in operation. These prove invaluable in giving us a sense of the general layout. However, there are even more exciting visual sources. One of them is Zev Porath, a prisoner employed in the camp headquarters building. Porath was a trained architect and used his skills to create a series of drawings of the camp that he took with him when he escaped. Another amazing source is the photography of Herman Levinter. Levinter, like Porath, was a prisoner but was employed by the SS as the official camp photographer. As a result, he was allowed some freedom to move about the camp taking pictures. In addition to the official photos he took for camp staff, Levinter also took clandestine photos, which he too brought with him when he escaped. He then returned in 1944 after liberation to take additional photographs of the site. These are just some of the varied documents that we are using to guide our reconstruction. This process of reconstruction raises lots of questions already. I'll touch on three in this introduction. One of the most critical is, how do we represent ambiguity? One of the dangers of a digital reconstruction is that its very realism suggests a level of truth that can be misleading. All our visual sources are anchored in time. They are snapshots of what the camp looked like and what buildings were present at a certain moment chronologically. Further, we don't have the same level of information about every space in the camp. Some are simply better documented than others. So how do we share our own levels of historical uncertainty with the user? Another important question is how do we reconstruct a place of oppression like Yanovska in an accurate but ethical manner? What level of realism should we strive for? Should we include human characters? What level of interactivity is appropriate? How do we recreate a space of cruelty in a respectful manner? Lastly, what can we learn historically from a scholarly reconstruction of the site? The digital world offers some really interesting opportunities to explore things like visibility. In a reconstructed environment, we can position ourselves at different places in the camp to look at what both prisoners and perpetrators could see. We can also use period lighting to explore what parts of the camp were visible at night. And of course, the process of researching each building or location in detail yields more insights into the built environment. I mentioned that the second goal of the project is to create an online learning platform based on the model. Here I hope to offer multiple curated tours of the space which present primary source information on different elements of the camp's history at each location in the camp. These interactions provide an opportunity for users to visit a space that has been almost completely lost to time. They also offer me the chance to examine how a virtual space can be best used to educate its virtual visitors, a topic that many heritage sites are contending with today. I'm very excited about this endeavor, and I look forward to the questions it will raise. I'm sure that we will encounter issues that we hadn't thought of and unforeseen challenges, but this is part of the process. More importantly, it is only through doing this work that many of these questions will even arise. Thanks for watching this short introduction to the project. I look forward to sharing future developments with you as we move forward. And thanks so much the United Kingdom's Arts and Humanities Research Council for supporting this project, and also to my partners in collaboration. If you're interested in learning more, 
please don't hesitate to reach out.